everybody. Happy Monday. Hopefully it's sunny where you are and you enjoyed your weekend. We're happy to have you. We're just sorting out the last details to make sure we have all the supplies ready for you today for today's webinar. We are joined by the always smiling Gary Zalapa, Director of Strategic Growth and Franchise Development for Century 21 Canada. And we're going a little bit more specific with our topic today, talking about teams and whether or not you're looking at a change in your business you're thinking about joining a team starting a team you just don't understand them and how they're put together we're hoping that this team program will help you understand them a little bit better and there's no one better than gary to give us the information so hello gary hello lee how are you doing very well thank great. you great well thank you for having me and good uh, nice to, good morning uh, to everybody and good afternoon to those uh, in the east with me here and uh, we did wake up to a sunny day so it is nice to that makes a big difference in everybody's attitudes i think so yeah today we're going to talk uh, about uh, teams uh, and whether you're you know whether you're thinking of uh, joining a team uh, maybe you're new in real estate and you think just what are these teams all about uh, or perhaps you're uh, more of a veteran and you're thinking about making some changes to how you do your business and you might be considering team, uh, a team set up or organization as the way to go. Um, and then all these questions come with that as well. What's the team look like? You know, so hopefully today uh, in this process, we can we can go through some of that. Um, I'll let everybody know that uh, there is a good participant workbook that's available to Century 21 members. Uh, that'll be in our resource center. Uh, in the resource area for you. I've also put a link perhaps in the uh, chat later for everybody. So so we'll start off and uh, look forward to chatting about this and maybe taking some questions. If you do have questions, just put them in the chat and Lee will be catching those uh, as we go. And so yeah, I'm excited to talk about Teams. Lee introduced me there. Uh, so our agenda is kind of a three-step uh, process. Uh, and uh, the first will be uh, kind of taking a look at uh, you know the team set up and how others organize your teams and the best practices in that and the second part will take us into uh, the HR kind of side of things uh, you know do you have the right people what kind of skill set uh, what are the job descriptions and what things should you be thinking about there and then the third uh, part of our agenda will be kind of like where you take it from here, whether you're going to go forward with the team, what's your game plan going to be look like. So, uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to, to bringing that uh, to, you, to you today. So, so let's start uh, with, uh, you know, you know, the old conversation is really the evolution of, of the real estate business. Uh, you know, uh, if you started in the business perhaps a long ago when I did, um, there, you know, the team was actually more built into the brokerage and, uh, and so things have evolved over time and uh, as you know now we have uh, individual salespeople that have decided to form a group of people together which is kind of this team concept uh, and uh, there's a different team organization probably for almost every team that I've spoken to across the country or if I had the opportunity to coach them or manage them over time, uh, there seems to be a little bit of a different concept for every team. So there's no one size fits all. So hopefully this process today will give you a blueprint and kind of a game, game plan to help you take your business through these questions and kind of diving into what you need and how your business, how you want it to look. And then you can perhaps come up, it'll give you a game plan to, to implement. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, why people are doing teams. I won't spend too much time here, but really most salespeople, when they say to me, you know, I say, well, why, why, do you, why do you want to do a team? What's, uh, what's on your mind? Most of them say one of these things, right? It's uh, they want to have a little bit more balance in their life. Perhaps they're finding they don't have enough time to do all the necessary activities in their business. Uh, and because of that, something is, hurt, you know, whether it's, personal side of their life is in balance or maybe it's, uh, you know, other interests are not balancing out, but uh, that's one of the things. The other is that uh, people see potential. Sometimes, as you know, in this business, you can be, uh, you know, being very successful on being active in the business, but you, you see that there's some potential out there that you could be doing maybe a little better or a little differently. And so this exercise will allow you to explore what that potential might be for you and whether a team is a solution for you to do that. And let's face it, everybody is looking to uh, have more resources, right? More, more money on the, into your pocket uh, and perhaps some money that's being left on the table. We know that is an example of that. Uh, I'll have agents that uh, will be so busy, they'll pick up the odd lead and they'll kind of it'll fall below the wayside because 
they were too busy chasing other business. And that might indicate that perhaps you're, you need to reorganize your business and whether it's a team or maybe it's just something you need to look at your processes, but that's another reason. So some of the best ways to identify uh, what your uh, kind of the gaps are uh, in your business to see what you, you, you could you identify, what are the opportunities for, for you is, uh, you know, take a look at these items in your business uh, that are listed here on, this, on, the, on the left side of your screen. So sphere of influence, uh, what I would kind of be looking at that is over the last perhaps year or two, what, what business did you perhaps not get? Like, you know, you know, you always see, oh, you see that listing that come up and it was, oh, it's your past client or somebody that you knew in your sphere listed their house. And you go, why did that happen, right? And, and, and so the reason is because for whatever reason, whatever reason in your business, you weren't able to even keep in touch with them enough to, to ensure that you were top of mind high enough to get their business. Now, there's always the odd case where maybe there was some other reason why they, they didn't deal with you. But so that would be identifying a way of saying, oh, I think there's some opportunity that I can put more resources in my business and, and, and get more of that business. So I would look at these items, whether it's uh, for sale by owners, uh, even in your geographic farm, if you've got an area that you work specifically in, you're, you can penetrate that market perhaps more. That would be an opportunity to say, you know, maybe, maybe we could be looking at a team. So this is a good little exercise that you can kind of kind of do a bit of a triage to see does your business, is your business ready uh, for some transformation? And so the next thing is say, you know, just because perhaps there's some uh, business opportunities that are out there, you also have to be honest with yourself to say, you know, do you have the skill set and the mindset uh, to be the business leader uh, for a team? Because being, you know, your business leader for yourself as a real estate person, that's pretty easy because, you know, you're just going to take, you're going to take care of the business that you need to do and you're your best judge. And, you know, if you're not doing your job, you know, but it's not really impacting as many other people, perhaps directly anyways. So that's a little easier. But once you get to having some, a team responsibility, you have to think a little bit more, you know, about your, your strengths uh, as, a, as this business person. You know, and, and a good question is, I always ask people come to me when I was a managing broker and they say, Gary, I want to set up a team. And I say, oh, okay, great. Well, let's look, let's look at your business plan. And nine times out of 10, they didn't even have that. So I think that's a start. Uh, that's where you really have to start. Uh, and I find over the last few years, real estate salespeople have become much better uh, at ensuring that they have a business plan and one that they actually follow. So this is possible, but this is where you have to start. Uh, so, you know, taking a look at your business plan, seeing what its objectives are in the kind of the short, medium, and long term. And, and, then, uh, and then basically being able to say, okay, based on that, let's take a look at what we want to, what, what are the opportunities for growth? And so once you've started putting a little thought into, you know, is there opportunity for growth? And, and am I the person to, to want to do this? Then you have to start thinking, well, okay, well, if I'm going to put some kind of business plan in place as a team, what's that going to look like? And, and this is where we start talking a little bit about the HR side of things. And, and I did mention earlier that there's really no hard, fast organizational structure for a team. There's not just, you know, it's not like one blueprint, say, okay, here, take this blueprint for this team. Here's all, here's how this is structured here. And you can take it over to another business and drop it in and it works perfect. So that's just not the case. Uh, every, everyone has a little unique structure, but there is a good system that I'm gonna walk you through today that I think will help you go through all the steps uh, point by point to get to the point where you can develop your own, your own team that would work for you. Uh, and it really is the, these, this, this basically this six step uh, path uh, for us. And uh, we're gonna look at uh, defining goals, uh, kind of establishing your time frame around accomplishing those goals. The next step would be communicating the plan to the people around you, because that's really important if your team doesn't understand the plan. Um, it's really highly unlikely they're going to be able to execute on it. And then, you know, making sure that you're taking check of your inventory uh, as far as uh, your human resources and your training and the skills that you're providing to your team. Uh, kind of looking at an analysis of the marketplace would be a slot analysis of strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and, and then really getting uh, going with, with your business. So from, uh, from uh, defining your goals activities, this is where you have to have your business planning done. So, you know, today is not the day we're going to get into an extensive business planning exercise, uh, but we do have great resources uh, in the Century 21 brand 
uh, for you to get your business plan structured and properly set up for you. And, you know, I can't encourage everybody enough to, to make sure they're doing that. The second is to really take your plan and say, okay, what are my, my goals in it? And then we take a look at the opportunities perhaps in your business that you're missing. This is where you would insert that. Uh, into your next couple of years and say, okay, what, what is the possible business, you know, quantifiable business that I could perhaps uh, get by setting up a growth in my business? And, uh, and then from there, you can kind of back it up to say, okay, uh, these are the number of transactions that kind of equates to by knowing what the average kind of commission dollars are in your, in your marketplace. And then, you know, using industry averages, how many appointments uh, to get to an appointment, and then really taking it right down to how many contacts a day. Uh, and this becomes really important on your weekly work plan, right? So this is the kind of exercise you need to do to kind of start quantifying uh, what those goals are. And, and then once you kind of get that, that idea in place, uh, you have to start thinking about, okay, now who do I need to be communicating this with? And, and how, how are we gonna get this all accomplished? And, and uh, it, you know, we did some research on this, so we have some information that we're going to share with you uh, that come, comes out of the U.S., uh, but I think it's, it is really relevant uh, to, uh, to our business in Canada as well. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is a little bit about trying to help com you communicate the message. Um, I can't uh, advise you enough to start with your broker. Uh, your broker has a tremendous wealth of knowledge in this area. Uh, and uh, they're there to help you grow your business. And uh, I think that uh, before you get off and running in the wrong direction, make sure you take some of the work that I encourage you to do earlier today already to your broker and sit down and say, you know, this is really what I'm looking to do. And, you know, and, and part of communicating what your plan is, is you need as a salesperson, I have a real clear idea of what your kind of value proposition is. Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, and be really, you know, passionately strong in understanding what that is. Uh, and, then, and then when you have that down, you got to get into you know, being able to, to state that and be able to summarize it and be able to communicate it in a really effective way. So definitely uh, high on the list is make sure that you, you book that meeting uh, with your broker on doing that. Then once you start to get into looking at uh, you know, how you're going to execute and set up and create your team, I think you kind of need to do, you, you kind of have to have an idea of what, what maybe you're good at now or what your business does really well now, and perhaps what are the opportunities that your business could take advantage of. And this is an example. I, I put business planning here. So, you know, if, if you're already doing business planning, obviously, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a good strength. And, and then, you know, but if you're not, then you have to identify where could I go to, to kind of avail myself to this resources. And so, you know, the, the, on the left, you got broker uh, and you got, uh, you know, whether it's other individuals or other people or, or your sales team around you, th these are the different uh, sources that you can identify uh, w where that, where that resource might be. And as I mentioned, you know, in the brand, we have some really great business planning. And so, and then I've identified on the other side, oh, there's an opportunity where I can prove. I mentioned before that you noticed that some of your sphere of influence were listing property and not dealing, you know, maybe you were missing that business. So I think that's an opportunity to identify. And then you look at that particular example and say, okay, where can I access resources currently that can assist me in building a system around, uh, you know, prospecting to your sphere of influence. Uh, and, you know, your brands and your brokers are, are really your key places uh, to start with that. So uh, that's an exercise that you need to go through to identify the things that you're really particularly strong at, and then the other items of the opportunities uh, that you can do. You know, then like in any business planning exercise, you, you know, you should do uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and really do a good scan so you're not missing anything. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this way you can make sure uh, that you're kind of covering all the bases because we've talked a lot about things that are kind of internal uh, to you as a real estate person and as a team leader, but you also have to kind of take a look at the, those external things, you know, some of your competition, what are they doing, what's uh, happening in your marketplace, uh, how are our team, are there, are there other teams that are being well, well received in the marketplace, are there growth opportunities, what segments of the market are growing, 
Um, are you doing, you know, are, is there new condo starts, condominium buildings that have been starting in your community and you're, you perhaps haven't had a, maybe a large share of that. So that might be a good opportunity to, to take a look at. Uh, and, then, and then obviously threats as well, always gonna be looking at, at what could risk your, uh, be a risk in your business. And then you kind of start getting into some of the fun stuff, uh, um, which would be a little, a little scary for others, but uh, this is where you're gonna to start to say, okay, I, I have a concept. I, you know, I know there's some business opportunities for me. Um, I'm comfortable with wanting to, to get more involved and be responsible and lead a group of people. And, and now I have to say, okay, what's that gonna look like? How am I gonna structure that? And uh, you know, there's, like I said, there's many uh, different uh, forms of teams. You know, there's, you know, there's it's just simple, you, I used to see them, I call them partnerships more than a team, I guess, but I would see two agents get together and they would come to me and they'd say, Gary, I, you know, I want to form a team. I, oh, okay. What, what do you think? Well, you know, and they'd say, you know, Jill and I are thinking of, of just getting together because when Jill goes away, I, I'm going to cover for her business and vice versa. I'm like, well, okay, well, that's, that's good. I, that's a good partnership agreement. And if you can work out the details on that, that works well. So, you know, that's one example. And, uh, you know, that the husband and wife team are pretty similar to that as well. You get agents and administrative assistants. So you have a lead agent and they may bring on somebody to help them with a variety of duties. And uh, the, in, in the workbook that we do have uh, in, in the area for you, there's some suggested uh, kind of roles and duties for some of these positions. So you, you might want to take a look at that uh, later to assist you with those kind of documents. But, uh, you know, but another uh, agent uh, team that we see set up is where we have the lead agent who's kind of like the, we call it the rainmaker or the, the folk, basically the, the individual is generating the business. Uh, and that, that individual creates a team with a bunch of other licensed agents around them doing specific things. That, that's where we're seeing a lot of uh, growth in, in teams. And then you'll see a team like that add a particular administration or some support on a technical nature. So let's get into uh, some of those more details on what that looks like. So here's a one model where you've got the basically the team leader and they saw a need and opportunity in their business. And then they added uh, some administrative assistant to help them per so perhaps they were looking at their business and they found themselves getting maybe a little bogged down on some of the, uh, the, the maybe it's listing paperwork. I know I used to have to chase real estate people a lot for documentation on listing, especially big producers. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're, they're all very, their time's really busy. So they're always uh, moving on to the next transaction. But this is something that you can help take a little bit of a burden off their plate by setting up an administrative assistant that team leader now has more free time to deal where they do really well, which is helping their customers. Uh, and, uh, and then in this particular example, you can see that they've also identified an opportunity that a team leader, especially one that gets strong with listings, a lot of team leaders tend to be big, we call them listers. So they're dealing with a lot of listings and sometimes they'll just say they really don't want to get into dealing with the buyers. You know, it's something that they, they, they do occasionally, but there's probably lost business there. That's where we identified perhaps there's some business that we could pick up. They can add, a, you know, whether it's one or a couple combination of buyer agents to perhaps start picking up that lost business, right? And then as you can see this model, they added a transaction coordinator later. I'll get into a little bit of a discussion around what those roles could look like. But in most examples in teams, there's a lot of crossover between the roles of especially the administrative assistant and the transaction coordinator. There's a lot of kind of meshing uh, and crossover that happens there. So that's not uncommon. So another team is kind of structured kind of like this. So, so a little differently where they've uh, structured the buyer's agent uh, to have somebody coordinating that, uh, more of a coordinator, and then some sub agents working underneath that individual and the team leader just kind of removed from that. Um, and then these teams can scale up quite large. Um, you know, you may be familiar, there's some teams in the country that, that have, you know, you're talking north of 50 people on a team. So you have to get a little more sophisticated with your organizational structure with that, uh, and also beef up your administrative and transaction coordinator. Uh, role. So, so those are all things to be look at, looking at when you're, when you're doing this. And so, you know, beyond, beyond, you know, getting kind of beyond that, that, you know, there, there's, there's, there's more 
responsibilities you can get into depending on the size of your team. Um, smaller teams I mentioned already, you get a lot of sharing in these roles or combination of these roles uh, because you can't have uh, this that, that distinct separation just because of the volume of business. But you know, obviously the larger teams uh, do get into a little bit more of that. So here's some interesting information. So this was uh, gathered basically from uh, oh, did I click on that? There we go, back to the small teams. So this is a, a kind of survey result. Uh, it's just about 100 uh, team leaders uh, across North America. Uh, and this is teams that did less than 50 transactions. And below, uh, in the graph below, this just shows you how the jobs descriptions are spread out amongst the teams in the kind of 50 or tr lower transactions. As you can see, it's dispersed over, you know, Quite a few of them are just buyers, agents, listing specialists. Combined, those two roles, admin. Those are kind of your top, uh, you know. And, and and as you can see, it also below tells you the kind of the average number of people that are kind of doing those roles in these teams. Um, but uh, most of it that we learned from this, from talking to these teams, was over forty percent of, of these teams started with an adding an administrative assistant first or a buyer or agent uh, role. So that, that's, those are the top, uh, that's the top kind of uh, avenue that teams uh, start to evolve in. Uh, and then when we get to the kind of as the team starts to grow, we look at it a little differently. And now, you know, teams that are maybe up to about 100 transactions, again, you still see the roles being distributed over a, a couple of people. There's not specific individuals just doing one thing you know you might have you know you start seeing the, the marketing coordinator those numbers come up and transaction coordinator number comes up as well but the other category is is, is up as well if you noticed and and really the other is where you're getting into roles and duties of, of people on your team that are doing lots of things whether that's some of the marketing maybe some help with the photography and maybe it's some you know writing some of the diet scripts and the there are descriptions for MLS properties, uh, you know, concierge of services we're seeing where you have an individual that's kind of taking care of the client needs uh, from uh, inbound requests. Uh, then you get people dealing with uh, you know, dealing with leads, whether those leads are coming in off listings or the leads are coming off buyers, how those leads are being uh, managed and incubated. You start to get a little more uh, precise with who's doing that, especially as you get into the larger teams. These are teams doing north of 100 deals per year. Uh, and uh, th these teams, uh, it, they started by focusing on adding a transaction coordinator. It was kind of the, 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 uh, one of the key people that they added. Uh, and, and, and then after that, then they started adding buyer agents to their teams. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, somebody doing north of 100 transactions, uh, you know, somebody to coordinate and manage that administration part of the business would be a big relief to a, to, to a busy real estate agent. Uh, so again, you can see here where other, the other category at the bottom in the graph, again, is, is still quite predominant, uh, but you can see, you know, larger teams, they have about just over four people that are kind of combined doing listing and buyers agents. Uh, so that's just an average of the oh, 100 or so teams that were interviewed for this. Um, and, uh, you know, almost three quarters of them have somebody designated to doing transaction coordinating. So uh, that role starts to grow uh, more important as the team grows. And that kind of makes a lot, that's pretty easy. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so let's look at a little bit about the how this is structured from a commission point of view. If you're if you're a team lead and you're thinking about setting up your team, you know it's going to be really important to you to to set up the proper financial structure to make it worthwhile uh, for only not only for you from a you know from a return on your investment point of view, but also to help you in the uh, growth and recruiting of your team. So um, what I want to really point out here is that this is this first graph is a, a graph that shows the commission structure uh, that team agents, so the, the agents that you're bringing on your team as team members, uh, those are the commission rates that you're setting for list for listings that they bring to the table. And so you can see quite a bit of a conventional uh, split across the board here. Uh, I'd say pre predominantly uh, the over 50% is in, in that kind of 70, 30, 75, 25 range. Um, 
that's being offered to those agents. Um, now, I will say the U.S. data, um, they definitely are more on the conventional side, so less focused on the uh, office fees and transaction fees, and a little, they're a little heavier focused on uh, straight up commission rates. Um, there are also some sliding scales, a smaller percentage of it was a sliding scale commission rate, but for the most part, uh, the majority of their team members that they're bringing on uh, are looking at some kind of traditional split in their marketplace. And I got an agent say to me, well, what should that be, Gary? What's, what's the commission split that I should be? And you really need to know what that is in your regional market. Like you really need to, you know, it's a very regional, there's variations across this country that are quite, uh, it's quite immense. So you have to really understand what that is in your marketplace uh, to be competitive. Uh, and then you take that, then you take it from there. And then you have to do, you know, you have to do a good analysis on if that's profitable and how that's going to work for you. So moving forward to the next uh, model, this kind of uh, uh, split uh, commissions taken in the survey, uh, which was on, uh, the, this is where the team leader is generating the business and what is the split uh, that you're offering to people. And as you can see, this changes up a little bit more. Uh, there's definitely uh, propensity moving towards more of a 50-50 concept uh, here. Uh, so not that all, there's still, you know, this 56% of the graph is there, but the, there's still a, a large portion of it is more uh, split, you know, evenly, uh, as opposed to, you know, favorable to the, to the team, uh, like to the, the team member. Um, and uh, th this is uh, makes makes a lot of sense because uh, as far as the generation of the business and the structure uh, and the resources and assets being used to create the business, it, all the risk is at the team leader. And so that's what that's why you want to create a, a team is to uh, is to acquire that. So you know when I'm coaching team leaders, when when I was coaching team leaders, I, I really have a heart to heart with them about not giving away the wrong amount of commission on business that they're really generating uh, and uh, understand truly how the business works. Uh, so you can see that that's how this is transpiring uh, across teams uh, in North America. Uh, teams are putting great systems in place and generating business and they're attracting teams, you know, because of the, the training uh, and the business that's available and the opportunity to work with the team they're not attracting the team members just because of commission rate. And, and, and that's a really important thing to understand because that's not your value proposition. You know, it can't be. So just important to, to understand that. So just looking at this is a, taking a look at uh, business generated by the team leader on the buyer side. Uh, and, and you can, again, you can see even higher split uh, percentages of splits closer to 50-50. Uh, in this case. So just kind of supporting the point that, that, I, that I'm making. So with all those kind of things in the back of your mind, now, you know, you got to be thinking, well, okay, what's my team going to look like for me? And, and here you can see uh, your little diagram here. Uh, you've got your team leader and he's, okay, I need uh, some admin support um, and, I, and I need some buyer's agents. So I'm going to list some agents here and I got a transaction coordinator, and you can see he's got different, he or she's got different years assigned. So it's kind of giving you like a map for your trajectory for your next five years, because you're not going to build it all overnight. Um, don't, don't, you know, that your team's going to evolve as you grow and you grow your business. So it's just a good example of perhaps what that, uh, what that looks like. Uh, and so you just step by step, what do I need to do next? Who do I need to add? And then how do I find that individual? And we're, we're going to get into a little bit about uh, how you do that as well. So, you know, this is where a little bit of a checkup for yourself, right? Um, now that you've identified that, you know, a team could be advantage, uh, advantageous for you to be set up in, or it could be advantageous for you to join a team. Um, but as a team leader, if this is truly the role that you're going to pick for yourself, um, I would say that being a team leader and being a real estate salesperson, there are some overlap in skills, but there are also some things that don't come, that are not generally naturally coming to some people. So you kind of have to understand what the gaps are for yourself here, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of it's going to be an attitude, right? Uh, you know, do you really enjoy helping people uh, grow their business and being part of that? You know, most you know, brokers, this is a strong suit for them, very passionate about helping people grow their business. And so 
that's that's a strong point, right? And so, and uh, you know, and not everybody's uh, skill sets are the same. So you just got to identify what the gaps are for yours, uh, because then you can deal with that. Because just because perhaps maybe you might have a weakness, it doesn't mean you can't be a team leader. It just means understand what your weakness is and perhaps bring in the proper resource to, to manage that uh, uh, for you. Uh, so, you know, there's just, you know, there's so many examples of what that could be, but uh, just understand what the, those limitations are for yourself. So then really now the decision is to kind of decide how do I find these people to make my team so, so successful that I, the way that we want it to be. This is not easy. Um, you know, Brokers spend a large part of their days recruiting uh, and growing businesses. And so it, being a team leader means you're going to become a bit of a recruiter. <clears throat> and uh, not only are you recruiting from a sales point of view to recruit as people who are going to be successful with your team with sales, but you're also going to have to recruit administrative people uh, and, and back-end folks, marketing people. Uh, and so that's not always a skill set that uh, real estate people have either. So this is where, you, where you're going to need to see what kind of gaps you have and find out how, how to help identify by you know, properly sourcing these people, uh, conducting a proper interview, uh, hiring the right people, uh, all kinds of uh, best practices uh, there. But definitely start with your, your broker uh, from, from that point of view. So uh, starting with your brokers, they may have some examples to help you with this. Uh, how to place some ads when you're looking to hire people, um, what kind of contracts do you want to use, uh, whether it's independent contractor agreements for some of your people, or it's going to be, uh, you may be getting into employment relations with people, you need to understand that and how it works for you. And so definitely consult with your broker uh, on exactly how that works and, and run it by your, your, your legal counsel as well. So how do you find these folks? You know, usually in your sphere of influence, your network. Uh, there's some really good people you probably already know. Um, this is just like uh, sales, whether you're going to get a listing or you're going to talk to somebody about joining your team. Same skill set involved, uh, understanding what your value proposition is, being able to communicate that really well, qualifying that individual, uh, and then, you know, making them the offer if you want to have them on board, right? So very similar uh process to sales. So these are things that we're good at. My, my warning would be don't hire the first person that you, you run out and find because it's a little, you know, you really need to make sure you're doing your homework uh, and go through a proper process before making the final decision and make sure that there's clarity on what the roles are going to be and, and how that all is all going to look. Uh, so next, once you've kind of getting your team going, uh, you need to start planning for uh, get, getting them organized, and that's uh, having a regular set of uh, whether it's meetings or a way to keep you on path on, on on your path. You know, I, I we, you know the best way is to have a couple set of meetings. One, one is more kind of operational, which is a kind of your you know weekly or you know what's going on today, who are you talking with, uh, you know who who's in the pipeline, how's that going, what do you need, that kind of thing. And then on a larger scale, kind of the bigger picture is more of a maybe a monthly or you know, maybe every six weeks where you kind of take a look at um, what the bigger picture is. Are we hitting our targets? Where do we need improvement? Uh, how are we measuring this? And, and how is that going? Really important not to get the two mixed up because I do find a lot of times we'll have our daily, you know, you have teams will have their daily meetings and they get sidetracked on what really should be maybe a you know, more strategic discussion. Just park, just take that item and just park it and just say, oh, we'll, we'll put that on the agenda for the next one. But you don't want to get tied down to this uh, a meeting that gets really lengthy, lengthy on something that you're not really dealing with operationally day to day, uh, that's going to detract people from wanting to attend your meetings. Um, people like to know that there's a set time, we're going to get in, do our business, and then we're going to be out. So definitely from a meeting 101, make sure that you're, you're doing that. Um, there's a couple of suggestions on looking at, at how you're, you're, you're dealing with things. You know, as a leader, you're going to be dealing or have conflicts. You're going to, you know, you want to share success. You're, you want to reward people. Um, you're going to have to get stronger at financials and budgeting uh, and also just being the leader in general. So these are all things that you want to make sure you're, you're coaching, getting coaching on or, or getting yourself prepped up and doing a good job at um, because, uh, you know, they can go off the rails if, you, if you're not paying attention uh, to many of these things. And then, uh, you know, once you've, you've started identifying 
what your plan is. You start to find some great people to join your team. It's not good enough just to find them. Now you have to make sure they get onboarded and become part of your team and understand their role and know what their job is. And, and so, you know, all these things need to be communicated to them in a very clear fashion. You have to have a written plan that you can communicate with your team members and that your team members can understand what's expected of them and their tasks um, from day to day so that they can continue uh, to, 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 to meet the team's objectives. A lot of times I find what happens, a uh, team leader sets up their team, uh, gets going, and then, you know, a couple months later, they're in my office as the broker, and they're going, yeah, it's just not working out, Gary. I, I got this team, and, I, you know, and, I, and they're, they're, they're not doing what they want to, to them to do. And I said, well, well, what's their job description? Let's say, and they will, well, well, what do you mean job description? So this is where clarity comes in. You, you know, if the people didn't even know what they need, you expected of them, how do you expect them to go do it, right? So uh, just make sure that they have the training that they need, you know, the tools and the systems and the support. Uh, for that. Uh, then, then as you get to, to, you know, you get better at this and, and setting up your team and, and, and better taking advantage of the market opportunities. And, you know, you identified that, you know, maybe there were some buyers leads that we were missing. Now we've got a good system in place. We're actually capturing those leads. We're growing the business. We're tracking it. And we're seeing that we're hitting the targets that we were saying. That gets exciting you know, because you're building something that, that, uh, that, that, that's really rewarding for you and your team to see, uh, and it'll start to get some momentum uh, to itself. And so as you're moving along in this kind of continuum, you, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're kind of ticking off, you know, you're tracking where you are. Tracking is really important, not only financially uh, from, a, from your budgeting point of view, but also from your target uh, for your business point of view or, and, and your customer service and all those things you want to make sure that you're hitting uh, and uh, have those goals kind of being out three, five years uh, from there and being reviewing them at a regular time. And so this where it gets exciting is that as you start to grow things, you got to hit uh, is that, that leap of faith, you know, a lot of people, you know, from a sales point of view, I was like, well, no, I can do it better myself. I need to go out and do that listing appointment because I'm, I know how to do it the way I do it. The key is to build the trust with quality people and be confident knowing that now your teammates are capable of going out because they have a clear vision of what your, 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 your value proposition and your mission and your goals of your team is. And they can go because you've given them the training and the skill set and they can go out into the marketplace and deliver that as it were perhaps you doing it. That's when you get into the sweet spot uh, and then where you see teams across the country that are really knocking it out of the park. That's where teams are being really successful. So it's a, it's a, it's a process to get there. Hopefully today we've given you a bit of a roadmap uh, and an exercise that allow you to go step by step to identify the things that you need to do to consider is a team for you and if it is how can, how can I set it up and who are the partners I need uh, to uh, to make that happen and so that kind of brings us to the end of the for, uh, the, the presentation portion um, Lee I'm happy to, to take I don't know if there are any questions but I'm happy to take any um, I'll leave that with you hi Gary I'm just turning my volume up here We've had a couple of questions come in that I think I'd like to ask you. If you do have any other questions, please put them in the Facebook comment section and we will get to them. But we have three questions so far. What kind of agent's character is suited best to be most productive to a team, for a team? You just cut out on me. So I heard the what type of agent and then it cut out on me. So what I type of agent's character is suited best or most productive for a team? What agent character is best suited? Like what kind of person are you looking for? Is there a good personality type? Is there a good, you know, a good drive that the person has? Is there anything that you can articulate that will help people find good team members? Yeah, I, I think the key message that I, I, I guess I would always advise people is to find compatibility. So I may be not able to say to you what particular trait are you looking for, but you definitely want compatibility in the style that you are, uh, because if there's not synergy and there's not a connectivity in how things are done, that can create problems to begin with. But then going into more, you know, I think you're looking for people who are, are who are willing and ready to, to learn uh, and are hungry for knowledge 
people who are hung, hungry to, to, to really practice things uh, at a higher level. Uh, because I do find a lot uh, in the real estate community, there's a, a lot of individual salespeople uh, who, um, who have gone in the business and then they just, they've struggled to really find their way. And I think uh, th if there's an appetite to really improve, that's a good candidate uh, for, for a team. So hopefully that answers uh, that. But compatibility is number one. You got to start with compatibility. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not a fit for each other, it could it could be a problem. Shared values are always key, and that actually leads us into the next question. What if someone still has a full time job? You said that you know you may be you may like them, you may have shared values, you may be getting used to each other, but what if they have another job as well? Yeah, no. So this comes up quite a bit, and you know I, I'll give you my my take on it. It's not for everybody, but I always like to believe that people had a path to becoming full-time in the business, that, that there's a proper course for people to, you know, people need to transition, I guess. And if I felt that there was a good uh, a willingness on the, uh, the individual to want to transition from being part-time into being full-time, because as a team leader, my I would want them to be full-time, but I would be prepared to take it to a certain individual based on who they are, if they had a path. And I would agree to a timeline for that, uh, and how we're going to get there, uh, and and then want them to be committed to that. And, and if there was a meeting of the minds, I would move forward uh, with somebody, uh, and depending on their role uh, on the team, obviously. But uh, I think that uh, I've seen some fantastic real estate agents who started as part-time people because they, the reality is they had to have other type of income, and then they transitioned to be top salespeople. So uh, don't... don't uh, I don't know if throw the baby out with their bathwater, but don't lose a good opportunity for somebody who you could maybe really coach and then earn their, you know, their trust and, and a commitment to you, right? The next question is certainly one that will depend on individual situations, but I'm wondering if you can give some advice to help people make the right decision. Is it better to have a higher split and pay monthly fees or have them responsible for the fees and a lower split? Yeah, that's a great question. So a little bit, I'm going to, a little bit of that is going to depend on your marketplace. Um, so if you're, you know, in a marketplace where you're, you see more fees, if there's more transaction fees and more agent monthly fees, I believe as a team leader that I would, I would take all those fees and I would pay them as a team leader. That'd be part of my structure. That doesn't mean that's the way it has to be. I just think that that makes more sense from my point of view. I would want to bring the agent in on more a traditional split package, do the coaching, have them hit the milestones and hit targets. And if they're not able to do that, then there's going to be a, you know, a, re, a period of time where we're going to have a, a chat and say, geez, you know, we've set up those targets and you know, if we can't get you doing this when it worked, then we, maybe it's not a good fit, right? So I'd rather be structured that way. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just found in my, you know, my experience, I've seen teams set up on the fees. What happens is a lot of new agents or people who are on teams don't want to commit to those kind of monthly uh, fees. And so I think I, I would try to stay away from them as a team leader. But that's just my take. The next couple of questions are related all about the longevity of a team. How long does a team typically stay together? Should you be putting that in a contract when someone joins a team? Should there be a probation period? What can you say about setting boundaries around how long you're going to be a team? Yeah, so uh, so I'm glad this question came up because I, I, I didn't really get into it too heavily. But if you're going to set up a team or some kind of partnership in any degree, if you didn't have a agreement in place, whether it was for your partnership or your team, uh, I, I wouldn't let you, as a broker, I wasn't gonna let you move forward until it was done, because this is the most important thing to have clarity in the role. So, you know, definitely need to have uh, written agreements that structure what everybody's role is on the team and how that looks, and how long that is for, and the, one of the most important things that needs to be in there, especially with a team and it's a, more like a, you know, it's agent A and agent B A together as a team uh, to form a team, you need to have clarity as to what happens if you're going to dissolve the team. Because I don't, as a broker, <laughs> I don't want to be a divorce attorney. 
And I say that in a, you know, I don't want a real estate people coming to me and say, well, we can't be a team anymore. We don't have any agreement on how to do this. Gary, you need to figure it out for us. And I'd say, there's no way I'm figuring that out for you. You need to have that agreement in place ahead of time. And, and, and some examples of that, you know, you need to, who, how are we going to deal with the business you brought in? Who were clients that we dealt with together? And how are we dealing with that future business uh, once we dissolve the partnership or the team? Uh, so, so definitely have those things in writing. Go to your broker uh, as a resource to start. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, definitely have clarity on all that with the job descriptions and duties and assignments and things like that uh, attached to them. Lee, did I cover all the points that you had? I believe you did there. Thank you. The next question, will a team leader distribute the commission to the whole team? No. Uh, so that's a great question. So uh, in most provinces uh, in Ontario, uh, the, the commission is all going to be dealt with the broker. So uh, the broker uh, is going to be the one that collects uh, the fee, just a normal. And the team leader will have a structure with the broker uh, that how that's all going to be uh, divvied up according to the contracts and agreements that the team leader has with the team with the team members so yeah the commission comes from the broker uh, just like uh, it would if you were a salesperson uh, as well the, the individual team leaders do not get into distributing that okay our final question shows quite a bit of self-awareness here but if I can't manage myself as an agent should I join a team <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't say not. I wouldn't say necessarily you, you should. Uh, and you might not want to tell your team leader that you're having a problem. <laughs> uh, you know, but maybe it's uh, self awareness is the first step towards rectifying. I, you know, it, it, yeah, a team's not for everybody. Uh, you know, but there are some people that could thrive really well on a team, and uh, I saw that over time. Uh, I saw folks uh, who came into the business who kind of were floundering around, not really finding their way. And then they joined a team and they got clarity of purpose because what happened with the team is the team leaders set really straightforward object objectives for the team members. And I find in real estate, this is the only business sometimes you can get into where once you're in it, nobody tells you what to do. You're kind of, you can't be on your own unless you have a really a great broker that's keeping track of you. So if you need that, I think that can really help you learn some great skills and become a, a better realtor. But you could also do that on your own if you want to really kind of kick yourself in the butt uh, and move forward with that. All right, Gary, thank you very much. And we will look forward to welcoming you back on Thursday. You're going to sort of wrap up everything that's happened in the last 21 days. That's been giving me a heavy like, plea. <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes, half an hour, right? Everything yeah. that's happened in the world in the last couple of weeks. I haven't been able to uh, sleep at night because of anyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll look forward to talking to you on Thursday. Yeah, but nice. before then, for everyone else, we have a couple of more webinars on tomorrow. We are welcoming... Arian Bezai, he's talking about eight factors to manage your personal finances. Excellent. So I think that will be really useful information for a lot of you about some of the things that you can be organizing and arranging right now when it comes to personal finances. Then I will be with you on Wednesday, and we're talking about the Century 21 Marketing Center. That's mm -hmm. when you go into your Google account, you scroll down and click on Marketing Center. So I'm gonna talk about some of the tools available to Century 21ers there and how you can make use of them in this time. Cause I know a lot of you aren't going out door knocking and putting door hangers on people's doors. So what are some of the tools that you can use and repurpose to keep doing your business at this time. And so then again, of course, we'll have Gary back on Thursday. And then we're kicking off our next 21 days on Friday. We are welcoming Rick Davidson, who's going to do a fireside chat with Chio Kokakino about mental and physical health during this time. So a jam-packed week ahead, and we will be publishing the schedule for the following four weeks a little bit later on this week. So thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye-bye.